be back with you that this week after a short vacation last week last week i wanted to share we had the opportunity to attend church with the munster indiana congregation up close to chicago and many of you might remember elaine schaefer who attended here for many years she was there and it was good good to see an old friend and a familiar face so she wanted to send her greetings to all of her friends down south here wanted to pass that along in his recent sermon on surrendering to God, Mr. Vincent used a quote from an unknown author in explaining one of his points, and he made the remark that the quote would be a good topic for the sermonette. My ears immediately perked up for two reasons. First, because the quote resonated with the personal goal that I've been working on, and second, because I had no idea what I was going to speak on today. So I was happy to have a tip. So Mr. Vincent has proof that at least in that moment, someone was listening to the sermon on that day. <laughs> now the quote that he read was this. It says, words that soak into your ears are whispered, not yelled. Words that soak into your ears are whispered, not yelled. The reason that this particular quote resonated with me is it's a good summary of something that I've been working on in our parenting journey. I thought that I was a pretty calm and even keeled and easygoing person until we had kids. And then I was pretty quickly disabused of that misunderstanding about myself. One of the great surprises of parenting has definitely been how many things there are that can make you frustrated and angry, and how easy it is when you're experiencing those emotions to, to raise your voice more than you need to or to start yelling. And then as if that revelation about yourself isn't enough, you start saying things that don't even make sense, like, stop being so loud, we don't yell in this family. <laughs> many of you may have had that experience as well. Well, as it turns out, the Bible has some excellent advice on the wisdom of speaking with a controlled approach that can be applied in many aspects of life. So if you like a title, as Mr. Crone says, it's the wisdom of controlling our volume. So in the time that we have remaining, let's examine three exciting and very desirable outcomes of controlling the tone and volume that we speak with. The first point is that controlling our volume leads to contentment. Controlling our volume leads to contentment. Contentment is a state of being that seems ever more elusive in the age and society that we live in. And it's hard enough to come by when we're maintaining healthy responses to our emotions. Not surprisingly then, contentment is all the harder to achieve when our emotions are controlling us as is often the case when we find ourselves raising the volume to get our point across. Both Proverbs and Ecclesiastes have wisdom to share in this regard. Let's start in Proverbs 17, Proverbs chapter 17 and verse one, which says, better is a dry morsel with quietness than a house full of feasting with strife. Now in this verse, a contrast is drawn between two ends of the spectrum. We humanly tend to assume that when there's physical abundance, the happiness and emotional satisfaction are sure to follow, but that's often not the case. Ironically, physical abundance can tend to shift our focus from gratefulness and appreciation for the basic blessings of life to all of the more selfish concerns that ultimately leave us dissatisfied. And so this important contrast is drawn between how we feel and what we have relative to our interactions with others. Now the word translated as quietness here is also translated in other verses as peace, peaceably, prosperity, or abundance. So the clear implication is though we may have little physically, if our interactions with others are characterized by peace, then we already have the abundance that will truly satisfy. And we should also notice here that the condition or state of peace is really described or illustrated by actions of quietness. 
The opposite of that, as the verse says, is strife. And as it implies, there's not much peace or quietness to be had when there is striving and disagreements and arguments. This point is also underscored by the words in Ecclesiastes 3. The beginning of that chapter has the the popular section that articulates many of life's seasons. And Ecclesiastes 3, 7 says that there is a time to keep silence and a time to speak. Now, there is in many times the need to practice the ultimate form of volume control, we might say, and to exercise both the wisdom and the self-control to simply not say anything. Again, primarily for the sake of peace and and true abundance of meaningful relationships. However, self-control manifests itself as appropriate in the moment, whether it's through quiet and measured words or through no words at all, controlling our volume does lead to contentment. The second point is that controlling our volume avoids foolishness. Controlling our volume avoids foolishness. There's another well-known quote that's been attributed to several famous individuals, but it seems to actually originate from a lesser known lady named Maurice Switzer in 1907. In a collection of maxims titled Mrs. Goose, her book, she wrote, it is better to remain silent at the risk of being thought a fool than to talk and remove all doubt of it. And if we're honest, we can all relate to that. We've all had moments where it's clear that it will be nearly impossible to say anything that really makes a positive contribution to whatever the situation is. But how many times do we open our mouths anyway? And all too often with a tone or a volume that's not helpful either. Now the wisdom in Mrs. Switzer's book may be partially inspired by Proverbs 17 verse 28 which says, even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace. When he shuts his lips, he is considered perceptive. Now this is even more true if we can avoid speaking in a tone or volume that's out of control. When you're talking loudly or yelling, it's so much easier to say things that are foolish, things that are harmful, or things that you don't really mean. Why is that? Well, it's just the simple reality that speaking from emotions like anger and frustration generally lowers or decreases the level of control that we're able to exert over what we say. Now, to be clear, we know that it's not wrong to feel anger or frustration. Being mad or upset at times is a vital part of the spectrum of emotions that God has created us with, and thus it's not inherently wrong to feel those things. As with so many other things, it's really what we do next, how we respond to those emotions that truly matters. So with respect to speaking or using our words, we are always far better off if we can internally recognize and acknowledge the emotions that we're feeling first. And then we can respond in a much more positive way with the proper control over our words or by staying silent, if that's more appropriate. The author of Ecclesiastes summarized the best approach very well in Ecclesiastes 9, Ecclesiastes chapter 9. And we'll look at verse 17. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 17, words of the wise spoken quietly should be heard rather than the shout of a ruler of fools. So undoubtedly, controlling our volume does avoid foolishness. The third and last point is that a controlled volume both leads to and results from righteousness. A controlled volume both leads to and results from righteousness. So consideration of this point begins with the realization that exerting this kind of measured approach to tone and volume that we've been speaking about requires the fruit of the Spirit called self-control. Now interestingly, self-control definitely does not mean that that you never have wrong thoughts or wrong tendencies where behavior is concerned. 
Much rather, it means that when those wrong thoughts or tendencies show themselves, you've allowed God's spirit to train your mind and body to redirect and replace them with a much more positive and helpful approach. In the King James translation, the word translated as self-control in Galatians 5 is in the New King James, or sorry, in the Old King James translated as temperance. Now, temperance is a bit of an old word, we might say. It's not used much in the day-to-day -day speech of our society, but its meaning is perfect for this subject. Merriam-Webster defines temperance as moderation in action, thought, or feeling, or simply as restraint. So controlling the tone and volume of our words most definitely requires this restraint this moderation in what we say and think and feel and do. And thus it requires us to practice this critically important fruit of self-control. Striving to live according to the fruit of self-control in this way contributes to being able to receive the overall fruit of righteousness. Now in Isaiah, we also learn that a controlled volume is a result of righteousness as well as an effect. Let's go to Isaiah 32, Isaiah chapter 32 and verse 17, which says the work of righteousness will be peace and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. So the word translated as quietness in this verse could also be translated to be quiet, to be tranquil, to be at peace, to rest, to lie still, or to be undisturbed. So this is the wonderful impact that righteousness has in our lives, and it stands in stark contrast to the opposite and very undesirable effects of not controlling our volume. So I'd like to close then by considering a statement, another statement by the author of Ecclesiastes, this is just after the verse we read explaining that quietly spoken words of wisdom are far better than the shouts of rulers who are acting foolishly. In Ecclesiastes 9 verse 18, the author states simply, wisdom is better than weapons of war. Wisdom is better than weapons of war. Raising our voice and using strong, loud words seems like a natural and fitting response when we're feeling combative and confrontational or when we're experiencing or feeling the reality of being ignored or, or unheard. But before we realize what's happening, we can start to use our voice as that weapon of war. Our voice can become a weapon of war. But as with so many things the Bible reveals, that there is a better way than what we're naturally inclined to, a way that results in far better and far more desirable outcomes. So let's make it our goal to realize those benefits from con controlling both our tone and our volume, to obtain contentment, to avoid foolishness, and to strive for righteousness and obtain its incredible results in our lives.